to Thursday Night Talk. This is a show where we discuss the week in Humboldt, the local issues of local personalities with the local personalities. I'm Telvi Freed, your local host for the next hour. Unless you just flew in from Mars, you're probably aware there's an election coming up on November 5th. Even if you did just fly in from Mars, I imagine with that technology, you would know that there's an election coming up in the U.S. on November 5th. While the national issues tend to suck all the oxygen out of the room, there are a number of state and local, sometimes confusing and contradictory ballot measures you will be asked to vote on. Joining us on the heels of the release of his annual ballot measure recommendations, which can be found at Redheaded Black Belt, aka KimKemp.com, is Attorney Delegate to the State Democratic Convention and KZZH and KMUD radio personality, Eric Kirk. Welcome! Hey, thank you for having me. Yes, cheers. So there are a lot of ballot measures, well, there's 10 of them, which affect us locally there there's another show that'll happen possibly if we have the energy for it about all the the local um happenings and what's only going to be on the local ballots though on a national level it's a busy year um i i do appreciate you being on the show we're gonna try to represent both sides of the measures for a more informational one though it's uh it's a show on access humble so we can give all of our opinions as much as we want and nobody can really stop us so that's great <laughs> let's let's start off with proposition just right just numeric order proposition two which authorizes bonds for public school and community college facilities uh, so uh you, would you like you, me to explain them um so yeah uh, yeah, yeah. I know that <clears> for First, people might be kind of curious as to why we have single digit propositions and then that skips all the way to the 30s. Um, yeah, and the reason, sure. yeah, well, the reason is, is that they reserve the single digit uh, for either constitutional amendments or bond issues such as Proposition 2. And the reason we're starting the Proposition 2 this round is there was a bond issue for housing projects um, that we voted on and passed in the March uh, primary. Um, so we start with two and we move up. And then every year, I think it starts over, except for for the uh, single digit ones, but prop uh, the, the other propositions that don't fit into those two categories I think go to about 100 and then they start over again. So we are on, uh, I think, 32 in terms of the large, in terms of the non um, single digit uh, categories. So uh, Proposition 2 is a bond measure. And a bond measure is when we actually vote to issue bonds that we make payments on. Um, as a state, um, it, it, there are also local bond measures, which we pay sometimes out of our, with, along with our property taxes, and that's actually going to come up in a later measure. But in order, in order to pass bonds, um, we, well, they, we, we pass them because these are, are usually for projects that we can't afford to really just take out of the general fund in any given year. We need to finance them. So we, we sell the bonds and then we pay uh, the, um, the, the pay payments on them. And, um, and so there are people who oppose it because they feel that our bonded indebtedness as a state uh, is getting too big. I don't know if it's been increasing or, or shrinking. We do eventually pay them off, but this is actually how we build things in, in California. Um, when we have major construction projects for, in this case, for schools, um, but it, but you know, for other things, then the only way we can accomplish that is to sell bonds. Now, the opponents will point out that by the time we're done uh, paying them off, 
um, that uh, we, we're ending up paying twice as much with the interest. We're ending up paying twice as much as the original debt. In other words, we'll end up paying 20 uh, billion for the 10 billion in these school bonds. Um, but that's also true of a mortgage. That doesn't stop us from doing mortgages that the proponents would argue. So this is 10 uh, billion in um, in school bonds to build buildings for um, uh, uh, secondary and education and the community colleges. Um, and to um, and, and it's a pretty straightforward and we have to pass these every once in a while. And that's what Proposition 2 is. And it's specifically for the repair, upgrade, construction of facilities at K through 12 public schools, community colleges, career technical education programs, improvement That's of right. safety conditions. Uh, a lot of people don't know what anything is. They're going to look at it for the first time when they go to vote and be like, oh, I don't know. Um, so consider this the preparedness episode. So yes vote sure. means state can borrow 10 billion from the federal government no means uh, no no they, they, the bonds get sold so it's uh so they they people actually invest and buy the bonds and they get paid off that way um so it's it's basically a a borrowing uh program and um you know it, Who are they it borrowing? is yeah wait okay. so Apparently, I don't know anything about bonds. Explain uh, that further. So I can buy one of these bonds if this. Passes. Oh, you can. You you can write. I mean, it, it's um. It, it, if you talk to your investor, you can, um, you can buy them as to whether or not they're a good investment or not. You got to talk to your investor, but. Um, well, it's if, a, yeah. So if the bond is passed. Ten billion will cost taxpayers an estimated 18 billion when repaid with interest. Yeah. It's so, a good long-term um in investment and a safe one because California is going to to pay it anyway, but it's um at any rate it, it is a um uh, but it's it may not make you as much money uh, as if you take more chances and some others it's considered a safe investment. A, 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 maybe not quite as safe as um as like t bills or whatever but anyway so that's um so the, the that's basically it bonds are issued um and we have to pay them off once we pass these measures and um so the question is is it worth it well um upgrading schools to, to we've got a lot of schools that are not earthquake retrofitted um, a lot of buildings uh, that uh, need repair, and we also need some new buildings. Um, so, as um, as uh, I don't know how many districts are actually growing at the moment in California. Um, we we do have uh, our birth rate in in the country is down, even with the immigrants. But 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 we definitely need to renew what we have and um, and and upgrade. Okay. It's it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just I'm like okay. It seems if you if you care about schools and educational institutions, you vote yes. If you don't, you vote no. Well, it's, it's not that you don't care. Um, what what um the opponents would say is we need we we need to only pay what we have, and so pay out of the general um fund, and the legislature needs needs to make those decisions. But again, you're talking about expensive programs so they would just say maybe we can't afford to build those things right now uh it doesn't mean they don't care it's just it's a different emphasis um it's it, in my biased writing i refer to the people who oppose these initiatives as well as tax increases as the, as the tax posses which have been around since proposition 13 in 1978 they generally feel like we should not be spending as much and you know they're they're right to a certain degree, but they're willing to make things. Uh, they 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 want the government to be forced to to curb its spending. But schools are something we all agree that we need, and um, so that's that's the controversy. Yeah, I think the controversy is where does the money then come from? It's just this random bond that people then have, but taxpayers somehow are affected by it. Well, we pay it out of the we pay 
the the payments on the bonds through the general fund and um if, and, or from other sources and um the um and so it it does we are going to be paying the interest the, the question is is do we have assets that are 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 worth it and um so that's that that you just you have to make that decision just like you make it in your own life when you decide you're going to buy a house it's going to put you in debt for quite a few years all right um next prop prop three constitutional right to marriage yes uh, and this uh, this has a historical context that um that people may remember back in 2008 um, we had, it was Proposition 8, um, so the opponents called it the Hateful Eight, um, but it, it basically established um, that right now Section 7.5 of the Constitution reads one sentence, only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. This, it passed, even though Obama won big um, for it, it, we were still at a point where people were thinking that marriage should be left to heterosexual couples who intended to have children, um, and, and uh, the, um, the even though that's not in there. But um, and what what this would do is it would pull that sentence out of the Constitution and it would re read the right to marry as a fundamental right. And uh, and it's it consistent with the inalienable rights to enjoy life, liberty, and to pursue pursue and obtain safety, happiness, and privacy, guaranteed by Section One of the Constitution. Unlike the federal Constitution, we actually have a privacy amendment, which, um, among other things, uh, guarantees the, the right to uh, choice in reproductive, and. Um, and it will also be protected. It basically establishes it as a, a fundamental right as opposed to a privilege. Um, some other jurisdictions would regard a, a marriage as a privilege rather than a right. If you pass it, it will not only uh, make lawful the um, the, um, the the marriage between uh, two people of the same gender, um, but it will also sanctify it. And 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 get and elevate its um, the protections of it. The opposition is kind of mixed bag. Um, some of them say that it's redundant with the existing law because the Oberfeld decision at the U.S. Supreme Court have established that uh, we have these rights, so we don't need to be amending our own constitution. But um, the proponents of this uh, of Proposition Three would argue that the Supreme Court has already overturned Roe v. Wade, and at least one or two of the justices, uh, Thomas, I believe, have said. And now we, we we may take another look at the Oberfeld decision and overturn that as well, turning it all back to the states. So, if it all gets turned back to the states, then the proponents want California to be one of those states that has uh, universal or equality of marriage. Sounds fair. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, the other uh, uh, part of the opposition, and it's kind of contradicts itself in the uh, official uh, state argument, is that, um, is that the research shows that children benefit more from a man and a woman as opposed to any other iteration, but um, you actually, it, it, and they worry that this is going to lead to uh, polygamy, uh, incest, and I forget what else, marrying children or something like that. Um, and and they're making that that argument. Uh, the interesting thing is, is um, three parents is actually better for a child than two parents. Um, so about that, four parents is even better. Um, it, it's uh, I mean, the more you've got, the more you can spread the responsibility around. Great, but uh, it's um, but that does it doesn't mean that it's essential for the child, and 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 doesn't and and the proponents argue that even if that's true, and we question those studies, but even if it's true, it does not justify the the denial of civil liberties to people who are oriented um, the same gender. Yeah, I'd like to see the actual studies on all of that. And it's interesting that the um, states that are far more conservative and believe in men and women are often the ones with with a ton of polygamy and child marriage. So, um, 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, no. And, and if you've got, you know, it takes a village. If you, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, condemning or endorsing uh, polygamy, but if, it, but it probably, I can see how you can make an argument how that's good for the kids. You know, you've got one parent uh, having to do things, and you've got parents that are more designated. I, I, I suppose it, 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 they could benefit. The point is, is it's not the government's business uh, for it, it, for the proponents' point of view. Okay, right. I mean, I, it's, it, I, it it seems ridiculous to be in California and remember that there's all this stuff happening out there. Um, you know, I think the overturning of Roe versus Wade it was always one of those. Uh, it could happen, but it won't ever really happen. And then that right. happened, so it almost feels like this is just another reinforcement one, kind of like the last, um, last elections, you know, right to bodily autonomy one yeah. measure so california so should be proud proud of itself in 1972 right about the time might even have been before roe v wade came down uh we by a ballot initiative passed proposition seven which in fact uh established the right to privacy which actually affects more than just um reproductive choice and so we were one of the first to put it into our our constitution and um it's it's a legacy the state should be proud of. It was um, actually authored by um, Mayor Moscone, who was uh, killed along with Harvey Milk um, by Dan White uh, a few years later. Interesting. Before we move on to Prop 4 now, let me just uh, give out the phone number for everybody so you can text if you have questions or want to make comments on any of the, the propositions, either side, we're, I'll try to remain neutral. I'll try. Um, Eric seems pretty level-headed. So you can text them to 707-498-4146. Again, 707-498-4146. Love how I called the Redwood Wonk level-headed, but it's true. Um, so <laughs> prop four, authorizes the bonds for safe drinking water, wildlife prevention, and protecting communities and natural lands from climate risks. So this is... And that's right. And this one's a little more complicated than uh, Proposition 2. It's not just about building and retrofitting things. There's a, a bunch of different uh, components to it. Um, and it's another $10 billion bond measure but it's got uh, almost about four of it is dedicated to drought, uh, drought uh, and flood um, uh, mitigation as well as water supplies. It would be to um, increase water supply, storage, flood, you know, and building of more reservoirs and all of that. Southern California actually has surprisingly few reservoirs for being how dry it is. So I, I don't know where they'll build it at this point, but. Um, but uh, and and then there's another 1.5 billion for maintenance of fire health and uh, forest health and wildfire protect prevention. Um, there is mitigation for sea level rise in coastal areas, which we're way behind on. I, I think San Francisco and San Mateo County are like the only two counties that are really um, ready for that. Um, and um, and and there of course are are grants to be applied for for that too. Land conservation and habitat restoration, including preservation of um, uh, uh, of wetlands that, unfortunately, due to the Supreme Court, um, the, the we've narrowed the definition of wetlands for protection. So this will provide some practical uh, protection for it. Energy infrastructure, a, a lot of it uh, geared towards offshore wind, and that could actually be helpful locally, um, as uh, people know. Uh, about 700 million for parks, about 450 million dealing with extreme heat situations, climate change. Um, it it, um, it is, it, and there's some people who oppose it on that basis. There is no such thing as climate change. Um, so why are we basing money based on a, a, a fantasy? And then there are farms and ag agriculture getting 300 million. Um, one of the things about this is at least 40% of the bond money must be used for activities that directly benefit lower income communities or communities most vulnerable to climate change, which are they, the way it, it works out tends to be lower income communities. So 
Um, it, it's it's good that it's structured this way. It's a bit more complicated, and it, not all of it is building things. So so some of the opposition questions whether or not we should be having a bond issue to pay for a lot of services that are more typically covered out of the general fund, out of the annual spending. Um, and um, others, uh, but the, the proponents say we can't be guaranteed that the legislature is going to show the leadership. These are things that need to be done. Um, and uh, in order for us to prepare uh, for for climate change as well as um, uh, as just the ongoing um, maintenance that uh, nature needs in a, a, a in a state that it, where its population is growing. We're going to take a quick break. We'll finish up with top four. We've got a lot more props going on, so yeah. uh, get ready because it's election season. We're discussing it. Be right back on Thursday night talk. Welcome back to Thursday Night Talk. I'm your local host, Aldi Freed. I'm here with Eric Kirk to discuss state and possibly local ballot measures. If you do have any questions for our guest, text them to 707-498-4146. That's 498-4146. So getting back quickly to Prop 4 before we move to Proposition sure. 5, uh, which was... Uh, 10 billion the number is 10 billion for every for every measure now for some reason or proposition and i i do have to say that that's a lot of money <laughs> i'm yes. kind of i we were discussing this before how i was like every they're just raising taxes on everything well i'm just paying you know i get taxed on my pay well i wasn't renting that much but internally i was and and i kind of you know what the vote means if you look at the voter guide uh voter guide dot sqs.ca.gov slash propositions um and if anybody wants to check out eric's article go to kimkemp.com though the the con says you know water and wildfire mitigation are necessity is not luxuries they should be budgeted for not bonded and i kind yeah. of have to say that's a very legitimate argument against all of these bonds it's just so much money and education it feels like should be a right and should be more long-term sustained than just a 10 billion dollar bond that feels like where is that money even going to go well that it, it lays out exactly where it goes i listed some of them but it lays out it's exactly what's allocated to each and there are some components that are typical for bonds uh anything that involves construction of um uh, of you know uh, wh anything whether it's um uh grants for wind farms or um or for reservoirs or um anything that that in involves that but it also has some things in it that may are, aren't typically part of a bond measure and that is where the opposition gets credit i don't I don't really have a clear analysis as to how much of it is and isn't it, but I think about probably at least more than half of it is allocated towards um, to towards what is are properly for bonds. You don't necessarily usually pass bonds for services or for um, or, you know for people to uh, or or for to support policies so much as we need to build this thing, we need to finance it, and um, and so it, it's a complicated one. It's kind of a wish list of, um, it, you could say a lot of them are environmentalists, but not all, but it, it's those aren't the only concerns um, in there. Uh, but the mitigation uh, for the climate change issues, including the rise of sea levels, just something we're way behind here. 
um, and um, and other places are behind here. I've I've been to uh, the San coast, uh, the Bayside coast of the San Mateo County, and I'm really impressed with what they've done. Um, I don't know where they got the money to do it, whether it's federal grants or, 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 or not, um, or, or previous bond issues that we've passed here. But they did an excellent job. You, I mean, you just you go to uh, their parks and you see what's what's been happening in there. They will probably skate through it. Whereas here, um, you know, you look at you drive on the safety corridor and you're looking right out at the water that it seems like it's yeah. almost going to come to you. Um, we haven't really addressed that. Um, and um, and it could become a problem. Will we all be having to use an old Arcata Road in a few years? Um, you know, I don't know. Right. Well, I'm not saying that Humboldt definitely wouldn't benefit from that being passed. It's uh, We are yeah. a waterlogged community that's getting more and more waterlogged each and every year. So it's, it's only a matter of time before infrastructure is going to be absolutely necessary but uh, but again I, I i just liked the wording of the con aspect which was mm -hmm. this should be like this is not a uh one one at least this is what i got i got from it it's not a one-time thing 10 billion isn't going to fix this it needs to be built right. into the tax into taxes permanently um but yeah. i guess it starts with a bond uh, well, we've already passed a few things that address some of these issues, um, uh, specifically around water. Um, and I think the legislature has even passed some things. It's just that the policy people around these issues say we need more. And um, so that is um, that, that's pretty much where we're at. Um, and, uh, you know, you just you have to make that kind of a decision because bonded indebtedness is a a serious thing that's money then that we have to pay every year that can't be dedicated to other short term issues um the more the larger our bonded debt is so just to keep this going prop 5 which confuses me because so allows local bond proposition five allows local bonds for affordable housing and public infrastructure with 55% voter approval, legislative constitutional amendment. Yes. And then explain well, it in layman terms to me. Yeah. I mean, in 1978, uh, you've probably heard of prop 13. It's probably the most famous proposition ever. It uh, completely changed the way we tax people um and uh for property taxes requiring a two-thirds majority for any tax increases um and because it was a constitutional amendment it can't be undone and that all that rule um also applies to bonds uh, local bonds when we pass them and local bonds of course we pass to build roads or um or uh, local fire houses whatever um, and what, but instead of it um, being paid by the state or out of the general fund, it gets attached to every single property. Um, and so there might be $25 a year for every property owner in a given district to pay for that community services district, for instance. Um, and, and, and uh, it's, um, and so, but it's, it's always a real challenge to because to get two thirds of voters to agree on anything is is a really hard uh, uh, um, haul. So this moves it down to fifty five percent, which um, the proponents would argue, you know, fifty five percent in any other electoral context is considered a landslide. It's not that easy. It's, it's not too easy to get, but it's also not so impossible. Uh, it, it's not it, it's not insurmountable, um, and um, so this would uh, make it a bit easier. Uh, opponents think, well, we're going to be passing a lot more bond initiatives, which means that people will be paying more on their property tax bill each time. And kind of the argument is made, well, oh, so many renters are going to vote on this; it doesn't affect them, but it does affect them because if you're paying more. Um, in your your uh, property tax bills every year, um, you're probably going to pass that on to your tenants. That's just you know uh, the, the way it works. So it affects everybody. Um, but it it um, at any rate, it's it's for 
in, in infrastructure. Uh, there's also some um, uh, complaints uh, from the opposition that it's kind of vague on what is meant by infrastructure. Um, yeah. And does, <laughs> does, doesn't define it very well. Um, but, you know, the, the direct democracy folks would say, look, it shouldn't matter what we're paying for. If we can get 55 percent of the people to agree for a bond in anything, it, you know, regardless of what, whether it's officially infrastructure, let the politics of the day decide that rather than trying to arbitrarily put limitations on it. Um, it is uh, it, it is something that. Um, that but it it is a, an attempt to um to to bring to make funding a little bit easier from a very cumbersome um proposition and i don't know what the rate is but i think it's like uh, uh, the, uh, at least half of bond measures don't pass this would probably make it more like 60 percent or 70 percent because you still aren't if it's not popular what you're planning to do um, you won't get that 55% is, is what the proponents say. Um, again, it's uh, the, but, but it, it, it bonds aren't technically taxes, but if you're paying it on your property tax bill every year, the, the difference is kind of a technicality to you. So just to, to keep going, um, Prop 6, which seems almost very uh, people- are very for Prop 6 majority because there, there wasn't even an argument against Proposition 6 submitted because nobody wanted to admit what the opposition would mean. So Proposition 6 eliminates constitutional the constitutional provision allowing involuntary servitude for incarcerated persons. Uh, and that would be a legislative constitutional amendment, which means essentially the the unpaid uh work that inmates do would no longer be allowed is that correct that that is correct uh the the um i, I this will officially ban in california chain gangs not that we have had chain gangs very many here in California, but that's you know, we've all seen it in the movies. Um, uh, and my old, old brother were out there uh, and the rest where they're all uh, changed and or or Shawshank Redemption where they they go out and it basically um, it it extends the Thirteenth Amendment into the California prison system um, and um, it, and and bans slavery. It simply states um, in, in Section 6, Article 1 of the Constitution currently reads, slavery is, is prohibited, involuntary servitude is prohibited, except to punish crime. And uh, the, it, it basically crosses that second part out and says slavery and involuntary servitude are prohibited, period, end of story. Um, they they cannot discipline any incarcerated person for refusing a work assignment. Um, that doesn't mean they can't ask for volunteers. It doesn't mean that they. It doesn't mean they even have to pay them well. They just have to be able to 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 pay them. But it's um, and and it does it, and they can provide incentives, awarding some type of credit to incarcerated incarcerated person who voluntarily accepts a work assignment. But they cannot be compelled. Um, and the proponents argue that, hey, this passed in Alabama of all places, which is about the most law and order state you, you've got. Why hasn't it, um, why, why haven't we done this in California? There is no organized opposition, um, but there are, are people who will argue and vote against it on the basis that, hey, if you commit a crime, uh, you shouldn't be allowed to just sit around in prison doing nothing. You should uh, you should be made to be productive, and maybe it will help you be more productive when you uh, get back out. Um, but uh, but there is nobody um, submitted an opposition um, point of view um, to, to for for the um, the the campaign. Pardon me for the ballot book. Um, so. Um, so that's that's where we're at, at with that. But it's uh, and civil libertarians would say this is long overdue. Why is it? Why is it 2024 uh, before we got around to this? When other states that are more draconian in their um, criminal justice systems 
past this a long time ago. Maybe that's why. <laughs> Maybe because human rights abuses were more common in those places, and so it became more of a an issue. It, um, but and and it hasn't really happened that people have been punished for involuntary servitude uh, in California. But this this basically codifies that into our constitution. Yes, the the prison. What is the the industrial prison complex? That it, I mean, right. are the prisons going to lose money because of the lost finances that they'll get because the inmates are no longer doing the free labor? Well, and, and they have whole, whole crews yeah. of of firemen and potentially women who go out and are I mean they're forced to do it essentially, but they go and fight fires for free though, which is absolute insanity. Um, though I guess better than sitting in a cell is why they've done it in California. And it does give work experience though. Does this mean that those positions will now be paid? It, I mean, no, probably not the minimum wage, but something. They'll, they'll be paid because it, 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 and it, um, but and, and incentivized, um, and the market system will have to work there because they can't be forced to do it. So uh, the inmates will have to decide: is that work worth that pay? Um, you know, as as we remember from the Shawshank Redemption, people were volunteering just to be able to get out of the prison, right? You know, so it, it's not like these projects won't necessarily happen. But um, as in that movie, uh, it's a bit of an industry trying to get the cheaper labor. Um, for only administrative costs to be able to do things. Famously, license plates are made by prisoners, right? This just means that they're going to get some kind of um, uh, some some kind of composition uh, uh, a compensation for it. And whether it's worth it to the prisoners, well, that that'll be up to them. I'm sure a lot is worth something if you are stuck in a holding cell and yeah, eating junk yeah um that's yeah and, and, and money no is... what, that just gives me icky feelings <laughs> i mean i mean i i'm i'm i mean i guess i can say it like i'm voting yes on this obviously because that's mm -hmm. ridiculous and way outdated that this even needs mm -hmm. to be a thing like and and for reference i i have a mom a nordic mom and if you look at the prison systems out there they are nearly 99% about rehabilitation rather than punishment. And it works really well in those small countries. And I think that's right. something that California should look at. And this might be a step in the right direction, though. It's just, it's such an icky topic, but I, I guess it, it's got to be spoken about. And the money, I, obviously there are things that the prison system doesn't provide to them. So it allows them to buy some things that are more luxuries than, than necessities. Um, and, but it also, um, they, have, they possibly will have money for when they leave. Now, they usually get a type of little bit of a, uh, a, a, a money for a transition when they get out there. But if they have more, uh, it might set them a little bit and, they, and, and might set them on on the right path for, you know, not ending up homeless um, if if they've saved up money to pay rent for a while. You know, I mean, it's just um, if you are going to make rehabilitation um, a, 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 the policy of your prison system, then you definitely uh, want them to be able to have some money when they get out and, uh, and more than is usually paid. So speaking of money and how it can set people up for 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 success prop 32 raises the minimum wage uh, yes and I, yeah um that, and and now we're up out of the constitutional amendments and bond issues this is uh would be a code and not a constitutional amendment we don't have a constitutional minimum wage but it would increase the general minimum wage to um, $17 in the short run and $18 in a couple of years. Um, the, if you're a small business, it'll I think it'll be a year behind. And then there'll be um, cost of living adjustments applied on an annual basis. The federal minimum wage hasn't been raised since I think the 1980s or something. It's ridiculous. It's like $7. 
um, or a little over seven dollars. Um, but this will um, the, the the proponents say that this will be good for the economy because the lower levels of people um, will, um, will 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 be able to buy things. Um, and um, the opposition says, well, that's inflationary. If poor people are able to buy things, then they're gonna then it's gonna drive prices up, and um, and so we, we have to take that into account. But also. It could lead to unemployment because if people can't afford uh, businesses, especially small businesses can't afford it, then they're going to lay people off. The problem with that argument is that the people who have minimum wages um, are, are the, the irony is that they tend to be essential, they, the, that the businesses that hire them um, can't really cut down on that labor. So will they be able to pass it on to the consumer? Maybe Maybe not. This gets into elastic demand curves um, because um, because price is determined on 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 demand and supply. Um, so they may or may not be able to pass it on. But then the theory I, also. I, I keep hearing that that it's yeah. based on supply and demand, and all these companies are raising prices because they have to because now they have to pay workers more, and yet their profits are just increasing and increasing and increasing every year, yet the right. wages are not keeping up with the inflation of their own products. I well, I kind of uh, right. judge and, if, and the businesses if I can't they... buy something from a place that I'm working yeah. on a within a one hour of me working there, uh, you are not paying me well. I mean depending on the product. You're just right. you're not paying right. me very well. So you, Things to look at. Let's take a quick break and then we can get back to ranting about minimum wage sure. uh, right here on Thursday Night Talk. Welcome back to Thursday Night Talk. We're discussing state and local ballot measures with Eric Kirk. If you have questions for me or for Eric, you can text them to 707-498-4146. We are discussing the propositions that you'll be finding on your ballot for the no November 5th election. And we are on Proposition 32, which raises minimum wage. Um, if you missed what was said before the break, well, you can find us on YouTube and rewatch it to your heart's content over and over and over again until you know what all of these propositions mean and you've got your stance and then you go vote because that's the most important part. We can sit here and talk about all these all day. We can be very well informed and all that. But if you don't go vote, then shh. <laughs> that's how I feel. Um, and if you can't vote because say you're, you're not allowed to vote, I guess, are felons allowed to vote in California now? Wasn't that on the uh, that was on uh, a different they, only after you've served your time and you're off probation? But yes, uh, you're once once you're done with that, you're allowed to vote. So not okay. Florida. So and non Florida. You, right, so some states don't felons allow it. So if you're incarcerated, by all means, have have your opinions. But if you <laughs> can vote, um, please do. <laughs> Just please do, especially if you're listening to the show, because that means you're a thinker, you're smart, and you're probably drop dead gorgeous to boot. Um, because all all listeners to Thursday Night Talk are are the best, the very best, the cream of the crop right here. So, Eric, we were discussing minimum or raising the minimum wage. Yeah, and I, I just want to point out something because they 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 are they first of all a business just because they have an increased cost does, can't necessarily pass that off on the consumers. It's a, it's what the consumers are willing to pay, right? Mm -hmm. So if the price gets too high, they say, well, I've got to charge this price um, because uh, because I've got to pay my workers all this. 
uh, the consumer will say, well, maybe I don't need that product. And so it, um, I, I think that, um, that, that that's what I was talking about with the demand curve. It doesn't necessarily mean that. They might just have to, to, um, to absorb it. If it's a public corporation, it might mean that the stockholders have to take less in dividends for a while. But the tendency, the study of when they've even increased regional uh, wages like Seattle and the rest is initially there are some layoffs. But in the long run, because there is more of a demand from a larger part of the population, they're going to buy things, um, maybe hamburgers and things like that, but not necessarily cars and things like that. But it will it will stimulate the local economy and the smaller businesses will benefit from that. It's a very complex calculus and, and, and it, ha it happens differently every time. Uh, but California is a large economy. We, uh, we know that we have people that can't afford there are, there are people who work full time who are homeless because they can't afford to get a first and last for rent um and and this is just trying to address that it, it, even 17 or 18 dollars uh, uh an hour is not a livable wage in a place like San yeah, Francisco but, sorry in Humboldt that's not a livable wage in yeah. Humboldt you i mean for anyone who has you know kids out there that is so beyond right. not a livable wage that it's, it's insane. Like there, I mean, there's a reason that the birth rate is going down in the United States. It's because people can't afford kids. Um, and it, it doesn't, you know, there's no comfort or sense of you can provide for them. You know, people say there are other the reasons around, as well, but, but yes, there's other reasons too. Yeah. Um, you know, constantly being at war forever and being sick of that might mm -hmm. be another one. Um, so, though, yeah, so uh, for those unaware of what the ballot measure fully is, uh, 25 or fewer employees, the minimum wage increases to $17, 26 or more employees at, at the, for employers, so at the businesses, if you have 26 or more employees, it goes to $17 immediately and then $18 on January 1st, 2025. That's right, um, yeah. Yes, yeah. and so... That's that's pretty much that. Uh, and this won't affect anybody else who is uh, who any other group who have acquired uh, minimum wages in their particular industry. For instance, the fast food industry already has their own minimum wage. I question the logic of that, but we won't, don't have time to get into that. Um, but uh, healthcare workers are 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 twenty five. I think it's a twenty five dollar uh, an hour minimum and um so they're trying to attract more qualified people i wish they would consider education before they consider fast food but you know it's um uh, because uh teachers aides are still down to minimum wage but that again that's a whole complicated discussion but this is the whole ocean rises so everybody will rise All right um moving on because we have a few propositions left mm -hmm. uh, Prop 33 expands local government's authority to enact rent control on residential property. Yes, it is. Uh, oh, so we in the 1990s, uh, a um, in response to a whole lot of rent control uh, measures that were being passed around the state, um, and and there have been fights. Uh, actually, not that many. I think probably about a dozen. To tell you the truth, the major cities and a few smaller places like Berkeley, Santa Monica, um, they they passed uh, rent control, and sometimes they passed what was called vacancy rent control. Um, the rent control, for instance, in San Francisco, if you're in there, they can only uh, increase your rent so much in a given year. But if you leave that apartment. Then you can jack it up how you want, uh, as much as you want, and that is part. I, I, some people believe why we have rent so high there, as opposed to other places that have vacancy rent control. They, the um, the landlords and realtors, um, pushed the legislature to do something about all of these radical rent control measures that were being passed, and so they passed the cost of. Hawkins Act, which basically says that uh, it prohibits local um, municipalities from passing rent control measures other than on a very limited basis. This would repeal that and allow local um, local counties, local cities to pass rent control once again. 
rent control is not always the best written thing. I mean, I, you know, like I said, um, people in Los Angeles, it's actually having an effect. Nobody wants to be a landlord. They, um, and, and, um, uh, because it's so, uh, questionably written and, um, but, but the, the argument of the proponents is that, look, we support local control. Um, if, if the local voters, enact a bad measure then hopefully they'll have the sense to, to to um to amend it later to change it in in subsequent measures but the um but the this this law should not be allowed to protect for to protect local communities from themselves at the statewide level this is really about um local control and um would it have any impact in Humboldt County um I don't think see any is huge rent control being passed here anytime soon, but it would have that option. Um, and so again, um, it's, um, it, it, do you support local control of rent control or do you just feel like too many tenants are going to, to be voting against you and, and, and make it dip more difficult for you as a landlord to, um, to get by? Yeah, I'm I'm super confused on this one because I've I've heard things from both sides. Mm -hmm. Housing in Humboldt is a very important topic, uh, mm -hmm. and I think because you're you, you're a landlord, um, I'm I'm now immediately like, well, I don't know if I should listen to you then because your side is obviously going to be for the benefit of yourself and the future, right. and maybe not necessarily the tenants. And what what would be best for tenants? I don't know because the both sides are going to promote what benefits they see effective. And, and time will tell with something like this. I'm not sure with something like, because there's already rent control in place in all over California. There, there is the Tenant Protection Act, and they they were hoping that that would deter um, something like this from passing, because it's not the first time this is has come up. I will just disclose to you, I am a landlord and I support this measure. Um, so it's, um, I think, take a real close look at it, what it represents um, and, and the rest. I would not want to be a landlord in Los Angeles. I, I would be iffy if I would want to be a landlord in um, San Francisco because I do think there's some problems with it. Um, but they, but again, it's hard to get a rent control measure passed. They, they've tried in Santa Cruz several times. It hasn't happened. Um, in San Francisco, I think three or four times they tried to get a vacancy rent control in, in, in place. And there was just such a hardcore lobby uh, against it that um, it, it just didn't happen. Um, like, but, but, uh, the tenant protection act isn't bad. Uh, I think it's got some flaws as uh, speaking as an attorney, um, uh, flaws that make it hard on both sides actually, but we don't have time to get into that. Um, and so, <laughs> and it's supported by a number of groups, including as we'll discuss in the, about the next initiative, the, um, uh, what is it? The AIDS, uh, uh, God, where is it? Uh, AHF, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. And we'll talk about why that's significant um, in when we talk about Proposition 34. Well, 34 is the uh, restriction of spending of prescription drug revenues by certain yeah. healthcare providers. Which... It, sounds, it sounds good on its face. Um, it it, it okay. requires that healthcare organizations, which meet specific criteria, must dedicate 98% of its funds to direct healthcare, leaving 2% to administration and other other costs. Um, and that would, of course, be crippling um, on on a lot of uh, healthcare organizations. But it's limited to healthcare organizations that spend more than a hundred million on items other than medical services. Um, well, there's only one organization that would be affected to anybody's knowledge, and that's the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Um, this is pushed by landlords who are, who are angry at the AIDS Healthcare Foundation for promoting rent control and, and renters' rights. And, and local, and, they, and their whole argument is always, why is an AIDS foundation dealing with housing issues anyway? And it would force them to become exclusively 
a um, uh, a, a uh, healthcare providing organization with only two percent allowed for the overhead. Um, this is considered by the opponents of the measure to be a revenge initiative that it's 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 made because landlords don't like what AHS, AHF is doing. Um, and AHF is not a perfect organization. There, there's there's some issues with some of the things they did, but the question is whether or not um, voters want to allow the initiative um, system to be weaponized against this. On the other hand, maybe if the if people out there feel that the Age Healthcare Foundation shouldn't be working on housing issues and should focus on AIDS and maybe other medical issues. But that's that's uh, the, that is Proposition 34. I feel like there's a lot more information that needs to be provided. No, no company can, you need administrative costs are part of every single company and mm -hmm. it's way more than 2%. So that's hopefully people look at that number and go, that is preposterous. Um, I'm not necessarily against something like that, but 98% must, it, that's, I've worked for nonprofits, a lot of, quite a few nonprofits and to only spend 2% on administrative costs would just, it, like you said, it would cripple the organization completely. Yeah, um, now the proponents say that it would if it's a administration that is strictly dedicated to direct health care that that would be incorporated into the proposition so it would cover that but the the way it's written um it's a little bit ambiguous um and so and that's another reason uh for the opposition the and so you know again i suggest everybody read it um, I, I, you know, it, it, the try to read at least the 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 analysis of the um, the neutral analysis that's provided in the handbook, um, ballot initiative handbook, and um, and make up your own minds on this because maybe the opposition is uh, you know might be you might feel that it's missing something here or that it's overstating um, the impact on. We got about four minutes and two ballots okay, left. Okay, we got to get through. Let's get through All this. Right. Prop 35 provides permanent funding for medical health care services. Yes, um, um, there is an, a, a modest tax in place on managed care health insurance plans that helps fund health care for low income people, basically supporting uh, Medi-Cal. Medi um, and it's supported by all kinds of medical organizations. It basically just makes permanent this tax that is helping uh, make um, care of uh, health care affordable through the um, Obamacare and and uh, and and through Medi-Cal. Uh, there is a real quickly a progressive opposition to it that says the problem is is that it's focused on paying providers um, it, for increased fees to providers that would dedicate a, a lot of this tax to, and um, and they're saying that that's not benefiting people. But we have a shortage of healthcare medical um, accepting healthcare providers in this because yeah. in Humboldt County because they're not adequately paid. It could actually have yeah, the effect. Know. Of expanding like a house. dollar per what it costs or something they right yeah know, it's I, just um and so just stop taking insurance or medical or or insurance certain insurances they're like just pay cash or don't pay at all because they're not getting right. anything for them from yeah everyone. yeah no and we we have a huge shortage of medical um accepting uh, health care people in humble county I so people accepting any insurance truthfully yeah well, I know, yeah, that's a whole other issue, but yeah. So, um, yeah, any questions about that? Nope, seemed pretty cut and dry there. Uh, at least for me, I'm like, well, that's that's an easy one. Um, sounds great, uh, healthcare, yay. Uh, Prop 36 allows felony charges and increases sentences for certain drug and theft crimes. Which okay, said this so would be the decriminalization. This is, uh, in 2014, we passed Proposition 47, which decriminalized or, or took took away jail sentences for certain crimes. Um, and um, and this uh, basically re repeals good portions of Prop 47, 
uh, blaming a lot of the recent crimes we've all seen on YouTube, the the crash and uh, mob uh, people breaking into windows and being very brazen, increases in um, in, in the um, healthcare. Uh, pardon me, in, in increases in uh, shoplifting. Uh, this would reverse some of that. It would allow them to make a felony, repeat shoplifters. Um, it uh, opposition says it would revive Reagan's war on drugs by 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 making prison mandatory for things uh, so much. And they argue that all of this happened after the pandemic, not because Prop 47 was passed. And it's complicated. It's but, very complicated, and maybe we can have a whole show on that one because I know that's one that Humboldt County is going to be obsessed with um, for so many yeah. reasons. So maybe we'll get into on another Thursday night talk. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, no round robin tonight because that's about all the time we have today. Thank you again to Eric for, for being on the show. You can check out his article on Redheaded Black Belt, which is kimkemp.com. If you have topics or suggestions for the show, please email us at kzzh at accesshumboldt.net. And just a reminder, the show replays Friday evening at 8 p.m. right here on KZZH 96.7 FM. You can also watch the show on Access Humboldt's YouTube channel. Hours and hours and hours of me just talking to all your local favorite people. All right, everyone, I hope you have a good night. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's it. Go vote. Please go vote. Even if you're not registered the day of, go vote. I'll get you registered. It'd be good.